Well, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, welcome to night one of this second edition of the Plenary Tracker, an online forum following the progress of the Australian Catholic Church's second and final assembly of the historic Plenary Council. We'll bring you news and insights from the Plenary Council from Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn with the support of the Australian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Garrett Publishing. My name is Genevieve Jacobs. I'm a longtime journalist and broadcaster here in Canberra. I'm delighted to be with you for the second time. Our intention this week is to track the second assembly of the Plenary Council from tonight until Friday, July 8, with a view to informing, sharing, critiquing, and for advocacy on behalf of the wider Catholic community, and in particular, the church reform movement. Essentially, we want to hold the assembly accountable by making its proceedings more transparent. So at 7.30 every night, you'll hear from council members, insiders, observers, and others to discuss the day's events as the council votes on issues that are central to the life of the Catholic Church in Australia. And of course, that includes you, if you're watching. The purpose of this tracker is very much to engage with ordinary concerned Catholics as we work towards a more humble, transparent and inclusive church. I'm going to begin every night by speaking to plenary council members. We'll move to a panel discussion with guests and to your questions. Please use the Q&A function on your screens to send us questions right through the discussion. We have a moderator tonight. It's my esteemed friend, Paul Bongiorno, a 34 year veteran of the Parliamentary Press Gallery, a founding member of Concerned Catholics, Canberra and Goulburn, and also the possessor of a master's degree in theology from the Urban University in Rome. We'll get to those questions around about halfway through the session. Now, I don't promise we'll reach them all or in the exact form that they're posed, but we will do our best to cover a diverse range of queries. And please keep those queries courteous and clear. Play the ball, not the person. This is not a space for disparaging others' genuinely held beliefs, but a space for vigorous and informed debate. James McEwen is our technical administrator, so please message him through the Q&A if you're experiencing any difficulties. We are aiming to cover a lot of territory this week. Most nights there'll be two topics, but this evening we're beginning with expectations, perhaps great expectations as the council begins the second stage of its work. This edition runs for an hour. The other trackers until that last night will be about 45 minutes or so, but let's begin with the news. The opening mass of the Second Assembly was concelebrated tonight at the Mary MacKillop Memorial Chapel in North Sydney. The principal celebrant was the Pope's ambassador to Australia, Archbishop Charles Balvo, and it is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Sunday, and this was recognised in the liturgy. Plenary Council President Archbishop Timothy Costello says, we have come to this point in the Council's journey, mindful of the hopes and prayers of so many who have laid the foundations for the week ahead. The Chair of Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn, John Warhurst, one of the delegates, says Catholics must face up to our failures and respond boldly and creatively. Our response must be couched not in vague generalities, but concrete reform proposals. But in a worrying development, the bishops will insist on their prerogative if their deliberative vote is at odds with the consultative vote of the assembly. So that means that the bishops can and will, if the circumstances arise, prevail with no explanation given. Francis Sullivan, the Chair of Catholic Social Services Australia and another delegate says the litmus test has arrived and asks, will the Catholic Church in Australia make a shift towards the estranged and the disaffected or is this business as usual? 30 motions will be voted on in the next four days with results posted at 1 p.m. each following day. First results will be announced on Tuesday after Monday's deliberations with the theme of reconciliation, healing wounds, receiving gifts. And now to our guests. There's been mixed commentary since the first assembly in October last year. We're going to start this week of webinars with insight from reform leaders who have been intimately engaged in the process and the issues. We'll hear about their expectations and through them, the expectations of thousands and thousands of Catholics nas nationally. Our Plenary Council members this evening are Emeritus Professor John Warhurst AO, a member of the Canberra Archdiocese and Chair of Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn and Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the ANU. 
He's joined by Catherine McAleer, who is a plenary council member from the Toowoomba Diocese, a primary school teacher. She now works with teachers in religious education and catechesis. She's worked in three dioceses across Queensland and Northern New South Wales and for Caritas Australia. She's passionate about sharing education with those who haven't had the same opportunities she has been blessed with. And fellow council member and Canberra local, Francis Sullivan, AO, is with us too. He chairs Catholic Social Services Australia and the Mater Group of Hospitals and was CEO of the Catholic Church's Truth, Justice and Healing Council. And uh, welcome to you all. Here we are again. Last year's first plenary council sessions were a major undertaking, something that nobody in the Catholic Church had experience with. Sometimes they were a revelation, sometimes proceedings were deeply frustrating. I'm wondering from each of you what your feeling is about what this next round of the council will bring. And John, I might start with you. Well, the rubber hits the road now, Genevieve, doesn't it? Um, this uh, second assembly will be very much about voting on the distillation of all those issues which have been raised by, uh, by the Catholic community um, over the last three, three or four years. Um, I think we have a right to expect um, great expectations, as you, as you said. Um, I hope that we won't be disappointed. I, I think we have a, a process now which is very, very tightly orchestrated, as one uh, plenary council member said to me uh, in a cab from the airport to, today, um, a very tight agenda. Um, I think overall, um, it's not as bold as it, as it should be. Um, we can describe the terms of the motions in, in various ways, um, but they're too cautious, I think, and, and uh, in some cases too defensive. That's not to um, be too critical. Um, I'm approaching this week um, looking at what we've got. We've, we've, got, we've got a set of motions, we've got a set of amendments, um, I think all members have the uh, responsibility to make the best of what we've got um, and to push the church in a transparent, humble, inclusive direction as far as, as, far as we can. Um, and um, that's really how I'm approaching the week, uh, Genevieve. Francis, what are your expectations? And perhaps you might explain to us how the council will run this time what the structural purpose of this assembly is, if you will, by contrast to what happened last year. Well, thanks, uh, Geneva, and hello, everyone. Once again, it's great that we're kicking off uh, our second go at this, and we got such great feedback last time. It's great to have you here. Um, look, I, like John, I'm an optimist, and I really feel that we're at a moment of change. We're at a classic Catholic moment, because now it all comes down to the words and the tone. And we've got to be careful about the language we use. Otherwise, the values that we're trying to highlight can be undermined or, in a sense, uh, weakened if we don't actually hold strongly to what we've all been advocating for for some time. I think most delegates or members, as they're officially called, know that there needs to be change. You know, it's a no brainer when we look at all the indicators of what's going on for the institution, everything's going backwards. And in many cases, it's going downwards. And I think most people that are involved in this whole plenary process recognize that. And it comes down to two major clumps. One is to do with structures and processes where a lot of us have been called calling for recognition of their dignity, but of their rights to participate. And I think that's going to be very strongly pursued over these days. But the other part is to do with our culture. The ingrained, if you like, knee-jerk reaction we can have as Catholics towards our place in society. And I think we've all woken up to the fact that the days of the Catholic arrogance are gone and our time to actually engage with our fellow citizens in the challenges of life need to be placed on the table. I'm less optimistic about the second clump than I am the first. So at the plenary this week, we will be asked to vote on motions 
some of those motions look pretty anodyne until we can get to the amendment stage. At some point, we'll vote on those, we being the members. And if a two thirds majority gets up, then that is passed. And then secretly overnight, the bishops will convene, lobby, and turn up in the morning and do a deliberative vote. And as you said in the intro, that's the final vote. And as someone was talking about with the Supreme Court and Roe versus Way, it doesn't mean it's the right vote, it's just the final vote. Yes, I think that's an extraordinary development or perhaps not so extraordinary as we've watched the process of this. But Catherine McAlee, let me go to you on this. There's been a fair bit of discussion in the church in general about Laudato Si, care for our common home, the cry of the earth, the cry of the poor, inclusion of women. Are you seeing even the language around the motions of the plenary council accurately, accurately reflect those concerns and the discussion that we can see taking place in the church all around us? Thanks, Genevieve. Um, it's an interesting question because there are elements. Um, the fact that they are both uh, in the motions, I think, is uh, is a positive. Um, and I mean, obviously, it's something that the, the church has been um, seeing as, as missing or as, as, as important. However, my concern, I suppose, around the motions is the, the strength of the language. Um, if we talk about modality of language, which uh, often the, um, the words um, may or could or can or might are used as opposed to must, should, um, you know, and I think the time for talking, um, yes, there is a time for talking. We had that at the first um, assembly um, and yes, um, although quite limited time for this assembly, um, but decisions need to be made and strong decisions. Um, and the motions as they stand, um, many of them lack that um, strength, I think. Mm. And, and you see that in the language, Catherine, in a number of ways. Do you see the inclusiveness that we discussed extensively in our first plenary tracker and that was a, a clear outcome of those first discussions? Do you see that reflected in the motions? Um, in some ways, yes, but not always explicitly. Uh, for example, um, the uh, obviously the inclusion of women, there is a motion around that um, the, that does link women and men. It doesn't just specify women. Um, but there are many um, groups within our church um, and many people within our church that are not specifically named. Um, so uh, I'm, by that I mean like the LGBT. A QIA plus community are not specifically named. Um, uh, divorced Catholics are often not named. And by that sheer omission of not naming them, we are excluding. Um, and I think that is, um, you know, a, that's another point around the language. Sometimes it's listed or it's written as people feel excluded. No, no, it's not about feeling excluded. They are excluded because by mere omission of them in those documents. John, actually, if I could return to you on this, take us through how much is clearly influenced by last year's proceedings and how much, by contrast, doesn't appear on that agenda. Is there a sense that there's a real disjunction between what members discussed and argued for last year and what we see on the agenda this time? I think, I think Genevieve, that many members, and it's very hard, of course, when you're, you're one member or you know perhaps another dozen members, it's, it's hard always to get a sense of the whole, of what the whole membership would like. But I think there's a sense in which the members have been fighting against an orchestration of the proceedings at the time of the, um, of the first assembly and since then. There's been a number of steps, um, we, we could go through them all. Some of them have been public, some of them have been private. Members have had a chance to um, make their comments and suggest their amendments. There are actually about over 600 uh, amendments moved uh, to the motions, which, which were released only about a month ago. Um, so I think, and very few of them, I think, have really been taken up with some sort of force and, and energy. There's been some textual changes to the, to the text. There's been 
uh, a couple of occasions. I'm, I've been interested particularly in the, the section dealing with women and men and the way the approach to women and the diaconate and how strong our voice is going to be has been sort of, you know, we've, we've, we've come at it sort of crab-like in a way, um, recognizing different views, but I don't think um, putting you know, a forceful proposition strongly enough and, and in the area of governance reform, I think what we there was much broader discussion at the first assembly than has actually appeared um, in the um, the motions and amendments for the second second assembly. So I think in some ways a lot has been lost, Genevieve, over that over that period. And it's um, a question of trying to work within the constraints which have been self-imposed. I mean, the the organisers can't complain about not being given a free hand. The, the design of the whole plenary council has been in the hands of the, of the organizers. And if it's got to the stage now where we run out of time and space and a lot has had to be squeezed out, then I think we, well, we all, but the, the organizers in particular have to take responsibility um, for that. So what I would suggest is that, that the richness of the small group discussion and the interventions in the first assembly, I don't think have been fully incorporated with all their passion and, and urgency in the motions. It's become, as another plenary council member said to me this afternoon, it's all become pretty bureaucratic, hasn't it? And I think that relates to some of the language that Catherine was speaking about and also um, some of the other processes that, that Francis was, was speaking about. I think we're sort of strapped into a process in a way and, and um, it's one which uh, doesn't allow I think in Joan Chittister's words, you know, the church to flap its wings and fly. We're, we're sort of being uh, tied down too much, I think, by the uh, formal processes of the second assembly. Uh, Francis, just before we bring in the rest of our panel guests, how does what happened last year inform your approach to these deliberations? Well, I, you know, I can only concur with what John's saying. I mean, we actually don't know how some decisions have been made about the papers we have in front of us, the motions we have in front of us. What we do know is that the criteria for making these decisions changes all the time, including between when we were meant to give input and what came back, which tells me that since the first assembly, the elements within the church and the Episcopal influence zone have become nervous about the degree to which the members were seeking change. And I think the uh, clamp has been put on to make sure that the bishops are able to say yes to all of the motions that are passed. And that in itself is the classic situation where the enthusiasm for innovation runs up against the inertia that's usually controlled and orchestrated by the bishops. And they vote as a block, even though individually, many of them, I think, would dearly like to see some light come through the cracks. And this is where we're at. The first assembly, we saw a mad scramble in the last day to get some resolutions organized because someone forgot to tell us what we were doing for four days. And in this assembly, we've been given the answers before we get in the room to ask the questions. I think it's a reminder, Francis, that caucus doesn't only operate up on the hill here in Canberra. <laughs> with all its rules and regulations. Let's, let's bring in our panel guests for this evening. Dr. Eleanor Flynn is with us. She's the co-chair of ACCR, a medical graduate with theology degrees, and she's the co-founder of Women's Wisdom in the Church, which has the wonderful, rather, rather wonderful acronym of WITCH with two Ws. Eleanor, welcome. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Genevieve. And Richard Curtin is also with us from Sense of the Faithful, a group of parishes from Melbourne and beyond who are aiming to facilitate discussion between parishes in Australia on key issues facing the church and to articulate a shared view where possible via their website. He and his wife, Jan, organised the consultations for the Plenary Council for their parish, St Carthage's in Parkville, Melbourne. He's an academic researcher specialising in public policy related to the Pacific and Timor-Leste migration to Australia. Richard, great to have you there too. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. 
Eleanor, I want to begin with you. A concerned Catholics member Fem Terry Futrell has written that all the indications are that change will be largely superficial, limited to a few less contentious topics with big issues ignored in what has been a tightly managed and manipulated affair. Uh, is that your sense too, or are you more positive? Look, I'd love to be more positive. Um, unfortunately, I think that is our view. Um, ACCC are um, um, lots of people within the organisation went through the uh, amendments um, and or went through the motions and provided um, various thoughts about how these were worded, um, particularly the uh, the concern that everything had to be adopted um, very much as Francis said, you, you're getting the answers before you get the questions, um, that everything had to be adopted willy-nilly. Um, that was a major concern for us. Another major concern is that there are, and, and somewhat as Catherine said, there are various proposals for change, but there's no no way of, of proving that any change has occurred. There's no outcomes. We People have mentioned the bureaucratic nature of these, but they haven't followed, if they're going to be bureaucratic, follow through and say, okay, within a year, we'll have this, or within two years, we'll have that, or we'll, we'll measure these outcomes. So there's none of that. It's all um, waffly, sort of you know, hope-filled uh, statements, but no clarity about exactly what they wanted to um, achieve from these uh, changes. Richard Curtin, do you think the council promises to be characterised by clarity? What, what confidence do you have? I think uh, it, it's going to be an exercise where a number of people are going to be disillusioned. And I think in some ways I was expecting that this would probably happen. And I hope that what it does is spur people on to a different form of uh, communication and synodality realizing that this sort of uh, rigid structure that the plenary council has operated within uh, within a highly uh, focused canon law perspective uh, is is something that uh, has its real limits and if we're going to be able to tackle a range of issues we need to do it with different structures with with different starting points Richard, the sense of the faithful group in Melbourne organised two face-to-face -face meetings and a national meeting by Zoom to formulate a joint statement endorsed by PC members about the Second Assembly. Can you tell us more about your statement? Well, uh, just about the process to begin with, uh, we thought it was very important to do what we thought needed to be done more widely. We all started off with a small group of uh, PC <laughs> members and uh, experts from the council, uh, discussed a statement and then took it to a larger group, uh, refined it in the light of their feedback and then put it out again and got uh, feedback from a national audience of some uh, 90 people. And, and that was a, a very valuable way of us being able to then put a joint statement out, which was supported by about 22 plenary council members and we thought that that was a, a valuable way of trying to influence what was going on. I mean, the, the points that we made were that it was very much a internally focused document, uh, not a strong emphasis on the challenges that were facing Australian society. In fact, uh, I don't think the motions at all make any reference to what the situation is in Australian society that the church is responding to. I think uh, uh, certainly that point about uh, not enough emphasis on uh, working out what concrete activities people are going to take. There's only one reference to an action plan, uh, and that's to do with the Lodato C action plans in parishes. Uh, I think uh, more, more generally, there's a, a, a wider sense that uh, there needed to be a, a much more uh, greater focus on inclusion, addressing key issues like clericalism. The latest uh, version, just looking at it, has only uh, two references to clericalism, and one of them is a quote from uh, Pope Francis. So a, a number of limitations with it as, as a document that was pointing to the future.
It's, it's an interesting reflection, I think, Richard, that a couple of the things that seem to be lacking in the carry through from last time are, as you say, the lack of reference to clericalism and the point that John made a little earlier about the lack of reference to, to governance, which was certainly a key issue that was debated vigorously at the first plenary assembly. Um, Eleanor, I want to come back to you with the question posed by Catherine about, about the language, particularly with regard to the realities of women's role in the church. What are the inferences of not being about, as you say, even allowing women in the pronouns? Yeah, yeah there's, there's, that's just appalling. Um, and there's also, there's no mention at all of the issue of inclusive language in the church. Um, there's, there's, that's just not even mentioned that, that this would be something that women and other people would find disturbing, distressing. Um, so that they, they just haven't covered that at all, haven't thought about it. The, and the language generally is, um, it's bureaucratic and it's, it's not, it, it doesn't engage people. It's, it's, it's very dry and, and depressing. Well, I'm, I'm feeling a little depressed at some of our conversation, to be absolutely honest, because I think there's a little sense of disenchantment creeping in, and that's an unfortunate thing so early in the process. Um, Catherine McAleer, I wanted to, to go back to you on the question of whether the findings of the last council have been carried forward to this one. I mean, there is criticism that there is a lack of rigour in the follow-up to almost all of the motions. Is that your sense too? Um. Yes, <laughs> um, quite simply. Um, I, I, I think I, in, in some ways, I was um, pleasantly surprised that um, some of the issues that were raised and that um, there was strong uh, interventions around that in the first agenda um, had dropped right off. Um, they were somewhat reinstated um, and um, they appeared more, um, more strongly, I suppose. But I feel where it was let down was that lack of strength in those motions. So um, uh, things like, for example, the, the, the topic of women in the church, that in the first agenda was like, it just almost was, was non-existent, but through the first assembly and through the discussions and the spiritual conversations um, and interventions right from um, you know right from the gate so to speak it was um, it was a topic that was on the table so clearly it couldn't go to the second assembly without drawing on some of that um, so they have but like I said I, I'm a little concerned that some of it is um, is weak we have come a long way. Um, and I guess that's where my opti optimism lies that, you know, we have moved forward. Francis Sullivan, this council was the brainchild of Archbishop Mark Coleridge, who's, who's now departing the Australian Bishops Council leadership role. Is the plenary structure itself perhaps outmoded? Have we got it right with the model that we've chosen for this enormous discussion for the church in Australia? It doesn't suit us and it doesn't suit our society and it doesn't suit Australian Catholics. I mean, the situation is in our world, men and women have equal rights. In the church, that's not the case. In our world, we do things democratically. In the church, that's not the case. And in our world, we decide what's right and wrong through a relational ethics. In the church, it's about rules. And so what we've got is a clash of civilizations here. And so I think most of us are entering into this process with goodwill, but we're not fools. And I think what we've... ...heard this evening is difficulties are, and we're trying to find ways in which we can move the show along. The thing that I think we've got to understand, or I have to really, I feel really deeply about, is that we're also talking to ourselves as a church. The majority of Catholics have gone. This, the, the plenary council means nothing to the Catholic community generally. Most don't even know what's on, and if they did, they've forgotten. 
And the reality is that most of the generations below me until they go back to, to get back to schools have found another lifestyle where they can pursue a good life and they don't seem to need the institutional church. And unless we can confront that as, as the remnant, if we can confront that, understand it, and then try to address it in deliberate ways, we end up just be having a talk fest. That's the real fear that I carry. And John Warhurst, I might go to you before we go to the questions. And I would just say that if you've got questions, they can go into the Q&A at any time. I can see those questions beginning to come in and we'll go to them very shortly. But, but John, to you, I mean, I, I think the sense was that, that Archbishop Mark Coleridge did this with the very best of intentions. I know, for example, that the, the German uh, Catholic Church has chosen quite a different way of discussing the issues that many of them that they have in common with us. But, but perhaps, you know, is there a risk that it's all for naught? We can't bridge that gap between what concerned, reform-minded activist Catholics, like many of those on the panel and listening tonight, feel, and then, on the other hand, the sometimes apparent intransigence of the church's structures. Look, there is always a risk. I don't think there's a risk that it's all for naught. I think, no, I no, not, not at all, not at all. And I think I've my immersion in the plenary council process over the last, well, particularly since the first assembly and, and onwards, um, leads me to be a relative optimist about, not necessarily about what might come out of this second assembly, but what the... Um, the sense of what the church is about, which is which can be found across the range of the members of this of this plenary council, I think uh, I think there is a sense that we really do need to change, um, which is bubbling bubbling on not just within the renewal movement but within others who wouldn't see themselves as as lodged within any movement, but uh, find themselves in this in this uh, plenary plenary council environment. I mean, we're playing uh, according to Vatican rules, if you like, and Francis has, has spoken about that and so have others. We're burdened down by the language of the church. We're also, I think, burdened down by various dynamics. I mean, we don't like to use the word conservatives and progressives, but that's certainly a dynamic within the assembly. Another dynamic, I think, is the one between a national vision of the church and a diocesan vision of the church, a diocesan, diocesan vision led by Episcopal leaders. And I think some of the, I, I, I can only guess, but I think some of the caution about um, accountability, about um, laying down action plans, about being transparent about what we're doing and reporting back to the Catholic community. Um, some of that, at least, I think, comes from just a pushback from those who are leading dioceses who don't want to be burdened by, by any of this transparency or accountability or inclusiveness or whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean that they personally don't believe in some of this, but they want to be the ones who make the decisions about what's being done on their own, on their own patch. Um, so I suppose what I'm trying to say is I like to put it in the context of other social modern social movements. We're really in a moment where we have to decide whether small steps in the right direction are enough or whether we really have to have some form of insurgency which says come on we have to do much much better than this uh, and and it's not acceptable just to be taking baby steps when we have within our power to take real strides forward uh, i'd like to see within the second assembly you know us striding forward as a church for heaven's sake, the, the uh, results of the census, which came out, you know, in the last week or two, show that if we're not striding forward, uh, we're not getting anywhere. We're actually going backwards. And uh, so that's that's the dilemma I see as a as a member of the plenary council. Are, are baby steps enough or do I have to find a way within the structures to push for much bolder, bigger strides forward um, in a way that people in other social movements also have to wrestle with? I mean, that's what I'm wrestling with, with at the moment. I like this idea of an insurgency. It's a, yes. it's a, good, it's a good choice of word, John. Yeah, um, well, yeah, and I think insurgency can come in different ways. It can come, you know, within the procedures of a meeting. It, it can become in challenging procedures as well as in, in challenging motions and, 
and pushing for the boldest amendments we can, we can find. I think the Second Assembly would benefit, uh, yes, from a bit of insurgency. However, we do, however it's defined, um, a bit of members taking back some of the lack of control, which I think they've ceded to the authorities over the past, um, at least the past nine months, but possibly longer than that. Yes, okay, there's the cry to barricades. I'm gonna bring in Paul Bongiorno, who's our moderator tonight. Paul, I can see the, the questions begin to flow in. Um, give us a sense of what people want to know. Hi there, um, Genevieve and, and panelists. Um, well, uh, it seems to be on, on two levels, really. One is there's quite a few process questions. A couple, I think, need answering, uh, which I'll put to you. Then there's the broader sense that we've all been discussing tonight. Is it, in the end, really worth it? Are we wasting our time? But let's go to uh, a, a few of the process questions. It's quite interesting to see people wanting to know. Um, they're saying, well, we were given the opportunity to comment on the draft. Will we be given the opportunity to comment and view on the final agenda? Um, maybe John Warhurst, uh, you could answer that, along with the uh, I, another question that dovetails with it. Um, Will the motions be debated? Uh, and if they are going to be debated genuinely, how will there be enough time to, to, to cover the lot? So can you answer those two questions, John? <laughs> yeah, I, I try to be informed about the processes of the Plenary Council, and I'm not sure I can give full answers. On the, on the second one, um, I think time is a real problem. And I think to... Uh, I give the benefit of the doubt to those who've put forward the amendments, the very limited amendments which have been put forward, that they may have decided, look, that's all we can fit into the available time. Um, and like any meeting, um, there will be debate in the sense of, um, you know, uh, there'll be speakers for and against uh, motions and for and against amendments. Um, how they'll actually been chosen is a bit opaque, which also is one of the problems with the, uh, the whole plenary council proce process. But yes, a number of speakers will be chosen uh, to speak up to two minutes on, e on uh, for or against um, and reflecting on particular amendments uh, and motions. So in that sense, I think it's a, it's a meeting procedure which would be familiar to, to people who've been in any sort of a meeting at, you know, in their professional lives or in their local, in their local communities. Um, I'll get some help from my fellow uh, uh, members on this. I had, I had assumed that the final program of, of motions and amendments was a public document. Um, and I, Catherine and Francis are uh, nodding so that that is the case, but it's all, I mean, it only came out on Wednesday night. So, there's two aspects to transparency, in my view, and that is, um, well, one, being transparent, but the other one is being timely. And I think being timely is where the whole assembly process has, uh, has fallen down. I don't think there'll be much time for the general Catholic community to influence the proceedings of the debates on the motions and amendments unless people get in very quickly and get on the, you know, get in, in contact with your favourite plenary council member, whoever, or your local plenary council member, and say, look, I'd like you to make an intervention of this sort on this amendment or on this, or on this motion. Uh, just uh, just uh, a quick and easy answer, really. Uh, if people go to www.plenarycouncil.catholic.org.au, which is the website of the plenary, you will find all the motions there. That they have been published, and you'll find them there. So that's right. That's right, Paul. The uh, just to just to be clear, the motions themselves um, effectively haven't changed. I, again, Catherine and Francis can jump in here from the framework of motions, which was published a month ago. Um, th there's certainly been textual changes to some of the um, general material that we, we're being asked to adopt. Um, it's the amendments, which I think are the really new development. And out of the 620 amendments, uh, they are not, there's no transparency about those amendments at the moment because the ones that have been chosen 
um, uh, have been chosen by the authorities, uh, but we don't really know, um, you know, what the general weight of or, or pattern of the, amend of the suggested amendments from the members uh, was over the last couple of weeks. Well, that brings us to um, another aspect of a few questions that have now come in along the lines of, is there any way we can influence the bishops or leadership of this week? Uh, and another um, question that says, well, given that the bishops can override without explanation, what changes can the plenary actually make? Uh, Dr. Eleanor Finn, I did notice that you uh, admitted you were hanging on by, was it your toenails or your fingernails? Yeah. <laughs> How would you go about addressing that sentiment, which, by the way, a few people have uh, raised tonight? Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, my toenails. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, I think that, uh, well, yes, as, I mean, as, as John says, those of us who know um, a plenary council member, and obviously all of you could work out how to get in touch with John or Francis or Catherine, perhaps, um, to get in touch with them. Um, you could write, try writing directly to the bishops, um, emailing the bishops and saying, you know, we, we noticed this and we're very concerned about this, or we think this is uh, a particularly um, egregious problem, or this is something that you've started to develop, but it could be developed more. Um, it's probably better to, if you want to get the bishops on side, is to write something very brief and slightly positive so that you say, I think this is, um, you know, you're moving in the right direction. However, you haven't got far enough for the, the general Catholic population um, to uh, accept this view. So they would be my suggestions for people. Yeah. Well, we hear a lot about uh, discernment and praying for each other, uh, you know, thoughts and prayers. Uh, someone from Melbourne has uh, made the point that the intercessory prayers for this Sunday in parishes across Melbourne made no mention of the plenary. Is this inertia, deliberate, exclusion, or sheer stupidity? Um, well, it's inertia. We can see that. But uh, I find that quite extraordinary myself, so that this huge event isn't being prayed for officially <laughs> in the churches around the Melbourne Archdiocese. I don't know about others. Um, it was in mine, but we have two members in our little parish. So. Uh, okay, well, that's good. Um, Catherine, uh, um, Catherine McAleer, a few people have, uh, you know, raised the issue uh, that you did about language and, you know, how weak it is. Um, can you just elaborate a bit more for two or three people who have raised this issue and uh, pointing to the fact that they believe that it actually uh, is very, um, very revelatory of of, of, well, maybe ill will. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, I guess, you know, when you when we read the, the motions and, and the amendments, um, as I said in the beginning, I think it's the modality, like how strong something, how strongly something is said. I don't think that these motions would be on the table if people didn't feel strongly about them. Um, and so it, there is such a disparity between what is being um, what is being said by the, the members um, and and remembering that the what, what the members bring is, um, you know, hopefully from their own experience in, you know, in parish life in their diocese. Um, so they're not just necessarily bringing their own voice, they're bringing the voice of many together. Um, the, the part I guess I, um, I, I struggle with is, you know, there's a saying that the standard we walk past is the standard we set. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we agree with the standard that has been given, um, is that that we are, um, are not being strong enough ourselves, I suppose, um, or do we settle for what is given um, and keep pushing? I suppose, I suppose that raises the question uh, and Francis Sullivan pointed this out, uh, and I noticed that one, one of our questioners has said that Elvis has left the building. <laughs> Elvis, Elvis being an increasing number of, uh, of Australian Catholics, uh, especially those who feel that they have been marginalised, perhaps because of their uh, sexual status or their marital status. Um, and they've got on with their lives. And maybe as Terry Futrell, one of our concerned Catholics wrote this week, uh, the bishops need to wake up to the fact that they actually don't own the Holy Spirit. Um, so, Francis Sullivan, you 
you were still a little bit optimistic uh, in, in your opening remarks. Uh, a couple of questions have said, well, when this plenary is over, where can we move? I mean, is there any other way in which we can perhaps get the church in Australia to uh, reform or to change or to meet the challenges? Uh, Paul, you know, the one thing I do is I stand in front of the mirror and I say, we are the church. Hmm. I think we've really not got to fall into the trap that the church is turning up at the plenary council. We're just members of the church meeting in a plenary council. We are the church and we have to not only claim our own agencies as individuals in that, but also start plumbing the tradition of our, if you like, church and the many pathways that are there for to be church, even the evolving pathways to be church and be confident about that. I mean, I am not one for going to a plenary council and somehow saying the reference point is that institution. The reference point for us all is our spiritual journey and in the Catholic tradition. That's our reference point. And for me, uh, the plenary council meetings are a set of meetings. And then after that, my responsibility for my spiritual journey with those I want to journey with continues and I think this is the point we've got to keep saying back to everybody let's find ways in which we can be a nurturing community so people feel they belong in whatever situation they're in because that frankly that is meant to be the definition of being Catholic it's holding unity across diversity and I think we've got to be strong confident articulate and passionate about that. And if other people go, that's not the church I want to be part of, that's cool. Mm. But I think we do, should not be cowered by this process, but be attentive to what's in it that we can build on and assist, but it doesn't have to define us. Interestingly, um, what we saw at the opening mass today was in many ways a, a, an application of some of the uh, good, you know, great, uh, significant liturgical reforms of Vatican II. The concelebrated mass was very new in the Latin church uh, because it uh, brought out the idea that our church is a communion of churches a commun led by their overseers, their bishops, etc. And we saw that uh, today. But I thought this was a fascinating question. Um, this woman says, I question what the liturgy says about synodality with such a mass of concelebrants. Would one celebrant and all participants mixed up in the pews give better witness? Could the final liturgy better show an inclusive communion? Richard Curtin, did any of those thoughts resonate with you? Well, I think uh, the liturgy has been used in a particular way to set the scene by those that wanted to have a strong influence on the direction. So certainly uh, the way the liturgy is organised sends very strong signals about what the wider message that's being sent. Mm -hmm. I, I Paul, actually, you know, Paul. Sorry, go on. You know, interestingly, when you're talking to liturgy, I just wouldn't want it to go, but at the end, we did a prayer of petition that Archbishop Tim Costello asked us all to pray together. And I thought it was very interesting where we go, where we're praying to the God. We go, you desire justice for all. Then we say, enable us to uphold the rights of others. If that's the litmus test for the next few days, how we uphold the rights of others it would be very telling by Friday night. Mm. Catherine, yes, sorry, well, sorry, John. Paul, well, I just, on the question of the, the liturgy, I, as a, I was in the rows of lay, lay people. And... Um, it's not me. I think, I think I, and I think that was the result of the concelebration, not just by all the bishops, but by many of the priests as well. Um, and... Um, um, it was done with the best of intentions, I'm sure, but I think it showed a very segmented church where I was lucky in that a priest I 
and you who wasn't consolidating, uh, you know, came and sat next to me among the other lay people, which was which was terrific. And I think I would have preferred, um, yeah, a much more mixed um, congregation of lay people and and uh, the lay and the, and the ordained all mixed together, other than those who were celebrating the mass. I don't have any firm views on how many that should have been, but I think it got a bit out of hand and uh, it meant that there was clearly a lay group and then and then the ordained group. And it, it emphasizes in a way which was not really synodal. It wasn't really in the spirit of the plenary council and the assembly, as far as I was concerned. Well, well I know there are many priests who have a view that when, when they go, they even if they sit in the pew without wearing their vestments, would leave that to the main celebrant up, uh, on the sanctuary, that they're all concelebrating. We are all concelebrants. Uh, Catherine McAleer, I, I, I'm just wondering, you're right, you know, your discussion on language and inclusiveness and, and the pronouns, but but um, isn't there a great problem if, if we can't talk about um, the equality of women uh, in, in, in uh, the, the, all the roles of the church um, and, and, and put this up to Rome? I mean, uh, Archbishop Coleridge in a radio interview this week said we have to be real about what we can deal with and real meant what the church allows us to deal with, whereas the Germans and the French and the Dutch say, well, hang on, Rome, and, and, and in fact, um, uh, was it the, uh, the, the Brazilians uh, earlier in the, last year, they said to Rome, this is what we need. We need married priests because we haven't got any priests. You know, why can't women be priests? We're not allowed to even put this for discussion. I mean, doesn't that go beyond the pronoun discussion? Absolutely. Um, and, and I think it's, um, you know, one of the things I find interesting is that, um, uh, you know, as a woman who walks into a church, um, you know, we, there's 50% of the um, congregation are immediately excluded um, by the fact, by the mere fact that they are not present um, in the celebration of the Eucharist, um, and yet they make up, in many cases, more than fifty percent of the congregation, um, and we, you know, which is um, quite telling, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, I think we. It, it goes beyond um, what is, um, you know, what what the rules are, so to speak. Um, I, and I think that we, we really need to be able to say, this is what we need. Like, you know, I've worked in some, um, you know, remote parts of um, the diocese, uh, from different dioceses. And, you know, it's the women who are holding those parishes together. They're leading lay led liturgies. Um, you know, they're doing a lot of those things that, you know, this is a this is a need that we have, and uh, and I think it's important that we fulfil it. However, the and I think this is important. However, the women of the church feel like that need needs to be met. Is it interesting? I don't think it's a, that um that the men need to be making that decision on our behalf. Well, well Dr. Eleanor Flynn, it was interesting watching the liturgy today. They actually did make a big effort to include a lot of women, uh, in, in terms of the the, the, the wonderful. Uh, uh, liturgy with the uh, um, to celebrate um, um, NADOC week at the beginning, and, and even even a sorry to the to the dispossession of of uh, first Australians. But I wonder. I correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I think now aren't women allowed to be acolytes on the altar? I think they are. So why did we have two male seminarians? presumably celibate, um, uh, rather than, you know, a couple of women acolytes actually on the sanctuary. Presumably the organising bishop um, decided that that was what they wanted um, or that they were, uh, you could, you knew who they were, they would be behave themselves and be tame. Um, but I, I agree totally with what Catherine says. Um, and coming from a medical background, you don't 
have conversations about people without them there. So having conversations about what women want without women there, without women being able to be part of those conversations is just madness. And it, it, it I mean, it speaks um, to the way the, the Roe versus um, problem in America um, that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a bunch of mostly men deciding what women want and how to um, work with women. Um, so I don't... Uh, I don't know why they decided to have a couple of um, seminarians, but probably because they were available. Well, Richard, have you got any thoughts on this broader discussion? Well, I as a I mere saw, male, <laughs> I I saw that statement in it's still there in this version of uh, the motions, saying that uh, women should be consulted, particularly in matters that affect them. I mean, what a ridiculous uh, thing to say. Uh, it, it shows the whole attitude that women have to be treated as a special class. So there's, there's a hell of a lot that needs to change for uh, the people who are behind the drafting of that motion about the place of women in the church to recognise that what equal treatment involves. Can I, can I bring sure. another small point in that we we often get in church documents the um, minorities or the, the marginalised or whatever, and women are included in that. And as Catherine quite rightly pointed out, women hold the church together in Australia. Then we're not a minority and we're not the marginalised. We are the marginalised by the church, but we, we aren't in the world. Well, yeah, a bit over 50 percent is hardly a margin, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, look, we're coming towards the end of our discussion. Uh, John, coming back to you, where, where we started, um, it's it's pretty clear. I think it's uh, there'll be no more plenaries, which I think, judging by tonight's discussion, we would all welcome. But maybe we do need something like the Germans are trying to get to, a sort of a, to give the word synodality or synod, um, you know, real meaning. But it seems to me that, the bishops will breathe a sigh of relief when this week is over. Is that the end of it? No, no it's, not the, it's not the end of it. I mean, I think in terms of synods, and I agree with what others have suggested that that's probably the way to go, um, there are positive motions about synods taking place at the diocesan level. Um, and that's, I think, and, and also a review process over a period of the next five, five to seven years. But just to focus on synods, uh, at the diocesan level, I think that's something which the renewal movement and, and the broader Catholic community should focus on because I think there are real opportunities there. I think there's also a proposal for a national synodal body, um, which is still very vague, but which I think does offer some possibilities for uh, real walking together and lay co-responsibility at the national level. I think in, in some of the... Um, the more specific areas like social services and education too. Um, my understanding of some of the motions is that there are calls for a, a wider national discussion uh, on these specific topics um, on a regular, regular basis. They won't be called synods, but they'll be national meetings of people concerned about education or social services or, or, or other areas. So I suppose I'm, I'm looking for the, the silver lining uh, rather than saying, look, you know, there'll be no third assembly and that the end of the world is nigh. Uh, I think there are opportunities if the best, the best of these motions and amendments are um, pushed forward for, um, for greater synodal um, processes and ways of doing business, because that's what it comes down to within, within the Australian church. And I think we should look for those, those possibilities. So um, finally, Catherine, what about the younger generation and the younger women generation? Do you think they would be interested in joining a future discussion if it's uh, rooted more in, in, in their reality? No, absolutely. Um, and I think that, um, that, you know, that is the next steps forward. And, and you know, regardless of, I, I suppose, regardless of what happens this week, and maybe even in spite of what happens this week, um, that that we, you know, as Francis said, we are the church, mm. and as members of the church, um, we can't sit idle. Um, if you know, when we believe something, um, th that 
it, you know, and as Pope Francis said, go out. So I think that that's what we're called to do is we're called to go out and, and to be the church and to engage in these discussions and to be the church in a way that we can be the church um, in, in, I suppose, um, the boundaries that exist. Well, thank you all very much. Before handing back to you, Genevieve, it's interesting that the, a lot of the later questions that have been coming in uh, are sort of people who have... Um, haven't expected much or expected more than they've got and they're disappointed. So in the five days of this week, maybe we can hope to see some straws in the wind or cracks of light that Francis Sullivan talks about uh, and we'll be tracking it, won't be <laughs> for the next three or four days. Indeed we will, Paul. And look, I, I want to reflect a, a couple of questions and a couple of things that were statements. One saying, I want to thank Francis Sullivan for his comments about a clash of cultures and that this process doesn't work well with us. Perhaps this is why I haven't been positive about the endeavor, even though I agree much needs to be addressed. And one which I think perhaps comes accompanied with perhaps even a shake of the finger from Margaret Rush, who says, is there not a moral necessity that there must be change or the whole process is a waste of money and that is sinful. <laughs> so there's, a, there's a, a real fillet for all those who want to see change take place. Look, thank you everyone for being with us this evening. You can also follow the Council's progress via several blogs, including from tonight's guests. Francis Sullivan is writing his blog with Catholic Social Services. John Warhurst is also blogging the proceeds with Concerned Catholics Canberra Goldman. And Geraldine Dude is also following the Plenary Council. If you're curious about the Council agenda, you can read Motions and Amendments document, which was released last week on the Australian Catholic Bishops site. Tomorrow, the business of the council is underway in earnest. We'll be considering reconciliation and also the sexual abuse crisis and we'll be joined among others by Father Frank Brennan, John Lachoyak and Rachel McLean to talk about reconciliation and Francis Sullivan and Dr. Rose Joyce to explore the child sex abuse scandal and its impact. Many thanks indeed to all of our guests. Many thanks to the hundreds and hundreds of people who've been listening throughout this discussion. Please join us as we track the Plenary Council for the remainder of this week. And uh, good night to you all. Thank you and God bless. <laughs>